Welcome to Advancing Our Church, a podcast about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and advancement. I'm Jim Friend, and before we get started, I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Changing Our World. If you're in charge of fundraising for a Catholic organization and you're looking to make a significant impact, Changing Our World can help. Their expert team provides customized services to help Catholic organizations radically connect with new and existing donors. So whether you're looking to start a new fundraising campaign or if you want to improve an existing one, Changing Our World can offer the guidance and support you need to achieve your fundraising goals. Just visit changingourworld.com today to learn more and check out the link to their website in the show notes of this episode. And now, let's get to work. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Advancing Our Church. I'm so glad you could join us today. I am joined today by my very special guest, Rob Fawn. And Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Jim. Glad to be here. Well, let me tell everyone a little bit about your background, Rob. Rob is a seasoned organizational leader with 20 plus years of fundraising and operations management experience in the nonprofit sector. He's recognized for demonstrating a natural aptitude for managing effective major gifts, annual giving, and direct mail fundraising campaigns. Rob was recently the VP of Philanthropy at Common Spirit Health Texas Division, where he managed philanthropic and revenue activities across 16 hospitals and multiple Texas-based sites. He also introduced federal grant strategies generating $2.1 million and supplied major gift assistance resulting in $2 million in philanthropic revenue. He's the former Director of Stewardship and Development for the Diocese of Colorado Springs, he is currently as senior consultant for the Giving Collaborative and a principal at the Blue Philanthropy Project. And we'll be talking about some of Rob's research today. Again, Rob, welcome to the podcast. So glad you could have you. We've we've known uh, you each other uh, quite a t- time, I think, going back to your time in the Diocese of Colorado Springs, uh, seeing each other at the ICSC conferences. It's great to be with you today. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be with you. And um yeah, those conferences um, uh, were fantastic because it was a whole ecosystem of relationships, right? And um, I still keep in touch with with those connections to this day, uh, yourself included, um, and and others as as they've sort of scattered throughout the United States. So, um, yeah, good good memories for sure. Very good and great contacts. I agree. I, I still, uh, in fact, just recently in my new position, I've been recruiting a couple of them for helping me out with my new role at the St. John Vianney Center. And there's nothing like a wonderful retired development director to provide you some some good expertise on, on your development committee. So I've got a couple of folks, I won't name them now, but uh, they're, they're just, uh, they've been super helpful in keeping them engaged. So um, Rob, why don't we start with, this is the question I've been asking folks recently. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us something about yourself that uh, is not commonly known. Yeah, so my go-to for this question, um, which I don't get asked very much, so uh, hopefully it's not commonly known. Um, I was uh, in junior high. I was on the Winter Park ski jumping team. So Winter Park is a, a resort here in Colorado, uh, where I live. Uh, I live in Colorado, not in Winter Park. Um, and uh, the the origin for this story is is kind of silly. So uh, there I was, sort of a, a a lump of a you know seventh grade boy. Um, in Denver. And my mom says, you need to do something. And, and I said, well, mom, I'm, I'm very happy playing Nintendo. Uh, this is this is my life. This is this is very satisfying for me. Thank you. And she said, no. Uh, and she she put down a, a catalog of activities for the local rec center. And she said, pick an activity from this catalog and you're doing it. And so uh, being sort of a sassy uh, young man, I, I, I picked the one thing that I knew she wouldn't go for. And it was ski jumping. Mm. Uh, which would uh, mean that she would have to drive me up into the mountains every weekend and spend lots of money. Uh, and anyway, she called my bluff and uh, I ended up uh, ski jumping and, and it was a lot of fun. And it also, I think, solidified my love for skiing in general. So um, that's where it came from. So I guess the joke's yeah. on me because uh, that's mm. that's an expensive habit that I've, I've not been able to kick. So <laughs> well, in, in where you live in that part of the country, I'm sure it comes in quite handy. Do you do it with uh, with your children as well now or? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> My daughter announced that she hate, hates it, uh, which is fine. <laughs> um, and then my boys, they're they're still in the stage of like they they are learning, yeah. but also they're 
uh, very eager and, and they want to ski with dad, that kind of thing. So, so it's really cool. My dream, of course, is that when they're big, uh, they're going to be advanced skiers and we can all just have great ski days. And I don't know, I'll probably be too old by then to join them on the serious terrain. But um, <laughs> yeah, we're it's it's yeah, I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it's yeah. something it, it's fun to share something that you love with your kids. It's it's very yeah. special. And they, they remember that. Well, Rob, um, tell us a little, a little bit about your career. We, we talk, I gave a little bit of an intro, but how did you end up in philanthropy? You know, it's funny. Many of us, um, I didn't go to school for philanthropy. I kind of backed into my career in philanthropy a little bit more than 20 years ago, like so many. But how did you end up in, in uh, Catholic philanthropy? Yeah, it's a, a great question, Jim. And um, I mean, we could we could have a whole a whole podcast series <laughs> just on this. Um, and uh, we'd have no listeners, probably. Right. Um, right. <laughs> uh, the, the the short version. Um, I'm a, a convert to the faith. Um, I entered the Catholic Church. I was raised Baptist. Um, entered the Catholic Church in uh, 2001 when I was in college, and and it you know as as you'd expect, it kind of changed my life and sort of changed the direction of my life. Um, a lot of a lot of crazy stuff happened um, in and around that time. Um, uh, both personally and sort of uh, within my community um, that sort of led me away from being Baptist and then uh, toward the Catholic Church eventually. I wasn't planning on becoming Catholic. I was definitely planning on not being Baptist. So um, so fast forward, I was in college. Uh, I, I ended up at Franciscan University of Steubenville. That's another wow. <laughs> story, which is, which is crazy. Um, how does a Baptist kid end up there? God's plan. Um, that's how it, that's how it happens. Yeah, God's plan, right? <laughs> absolutely. And I met some amazing people along the way, and um, so that was part of my journey. Um, after that, I joined the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, which, for the listeners who aren't familiar with the Jesuit Volunteer Corps, it's a, a volunteer year, uh, typically after college, but doesn't have to be, um, where they put you in a city, uh, put you in a nonprofit organization where you can. Uh, work for for nothing. We I made like seventy five bucks a month, and I was in New <laughs> Orleans, and I worked at Innocence Project New Orleans, where uh, we got innocent people out of jail, and it was awesome. Like it yeah. was so great. And my my calculus here, my math about thinking about where I should take my career was, I'll never be rich. I'll never be a billionaire. You know, I just I don't think I have that. Um, but I can make an impact, and I'd like to make an impact. So, so that kind of put me on the trajectory for a career in the nonprofit world. And then I thought, you know, I, I'd like to uh, get married and have a family and, and continue my skiing habit. See, it all goes back to skiing. Goes back to skiing, um, right. <laughs> and, and so typically, like sort of what, what discipline within the nonprofit uh, world could, could maybe provide for that. So that led me to, to development. I kind of have a, a gift, the gift of gab. Um, I like to talk to people. I love to communicate passion and mission. Um, so yeah, so I decided to get into development. My, my first job was, uh, 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 uh assistant, um, administrative assistant for the grants director at uh, Catholic charities in Denver. Yeah, and, that. and that's all I needed, just a foot in the door. And then, mm -hmm. and then, uh, yeah. Off and it's running. That's great. great. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow. Well, well um, congratulations on, on a great career. I mean, it's, it's been exciting to see it from afar. I, I think um, we all kind of find our ways in, in different ways to, to the, on this path and then um, finding your way into the faith as well. Uh, it really was God's plan. I, I'm also a convert. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah, I was. Yeah. Uh, I was a little younger though. We, my, my mom uh, converted to Catholicism when my brother and I were young, and uh, I made my profession of faith when I was 13. I don't know. It's just it, it yeah. takes takes all kinds to form the the faith that we that we have and the work that we do. So yeah, anyway, you know, thank, from from yeah. my perspective, it was. Um, you know, it's like entering this, this beautiful land. Right. Yeah. And, and it's like, wow, I, <laughs> I yeah. love it here. And, and yes. I want to take care of it and uh, add to it in, in so far as I can. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, I remember just learning about the Eucharist and how that made such a big impact on me and just understanding the real presence. And, um, I just, uh, and, and just kind of asking the priest, what is it, you know, like when I, cause I was so young, what is it that makes us different from the Protestants? Like I wanted to understand like what, 
what what separates it and and he said it really it, a lot of it comes down to the eucharist you know and and the and the uh, teaching authority of the church that was handed down from saint peter and it's like oh wow i was like whoa this whole world opens up and yeah even yeah. come to understand it and and continue to try to understand it even now into my 50s <laughs> yeah so yeah uh, no it's yeah and that's the thing it continues to unfold you know? yeah absolutely well, Rob, um, you had uh, shared with me some of your research on this Blue Philanthropy Project, and uh, maybe you could give it a little bit of an intro and tell us about it and how, how you kind of got it started. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Jim. So um, uh, backstory, uh, um, I think, would be helpful uh, for the listeners. Sure. Um, I, uh, I had worked, and Jim, where you and I met was uh, through my work at the Diocese of Colorado Springs. After the diocese, I went to work for uh, Catholic Health Initiatives, um, which is a big Catholic health care uh, organization. At the time, they had about 100 hospitals that they were running. Um, since then, they, they've changed to Common Spirit Health, um, and uh, they're running about 150 some odd hospitals, depending on the day. Um, and, and all within that, uh, umbrella of Catholic healthcare. And I was doing this, a similar thing, right? Fundraising, um, with a specific focus on major gift philanthropy, um, capital campaigns as well. Um, and I had the pleasure of, uh, being the interim, uh, VP of philanthropy in, in Texas, uh, last fall, which was, which was incredible. So I feel like I had a really good perspective over how, um, healthcare philanthropy within the Catholic space works. Um, uh, Catholic healthcare is, is not just for Catholics, it's for everybody. Um, and in fact, uh, common spirit health, uh, by their own statistics, they, they reach or serve, uh, one of every four Americans in the United States. So it's a massive, massive system. Impressive. Um, so in March, well, let's back up even further. Um, uh, sadly, my, my mother was diagnosed with ALS um, a few years ago, and, and she, she lost that battle back in January. Um, in March, I was laid off from my position at Common Spirit Health um, due to just uh, really immense financial pressures. Uh, a lot of folks were um, subject to that. And uh, sort of given the two, <laughs> the, the, the two um, kind of intense situations that I was going through, I didn't really know what to do and, and I knew what not to do. Right. What I'm not going to, you know, sit on my Nintendo. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and play video games all day and, and mope around. Um, but but I, I didn't know sort of what direction I should take things. Um, so there's there's been a question in my life uh, since I joined Catholic Health Initiatives, which was what would happen if we took the tools that are typically used in healthcare and even higher education, um, colleges and universities, and, and we point those tools at, at uh, diocesan philanthropy, point them at uh, parish philanthropy as well. What, what could we learn? Um, so I thought, okay, yeah, that's, that's a really good, uh, useful project. Um, I could study that. So I, so I built this, uh, it's called Blue Philanthropy. Um, I'd like to say I had a, a noble uh, purpose in naming the the project, but I named it after my dog, uh, Blue. <laughs> and uh, kind of the mission of that project is to study the Catholic dollar. Like, how do Catholics give? Um, where do Catholics give? And um, yeah, what you know, what's what's sort of the 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 profile of Catholic philanthropy in the United States? Because Jim, I, I know you and I have sat through many conference sessions. Um, I, I'm calling to mind Chuck Zeck, uh, that yeah, researcher sure. from Villanova, mm -hmm. who whose research really was groundbreaking. And he said Catholics give you know 1.1 to 1.2 percent of their total income to their parish, which is uh, significantly lower than um, any other sort of Christian denomination, uh, and it's lower than typical religious philanthropy in general. Um, yeah. Um, and, and I wanted to see if that was true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not a statistician. I'm an English major. So it was sort of an ambitious project. But given that I had time on my hands, I, I wanted to do it. Um, so the way that I went about this was uh, I put on LinkedIn, hey, uh, I'm, I'm doing this project. I'm, I'm really curious to see what what this looks like uh, within parishes throughout the United States. Um, and, and I'd like to, I'd like to analyze parish data. And I thought that, you know, that would mean the floodgates uh, would open and parishes would just 
uh, be sending me Excel spreadsheets with all of their data from all over the United States. And that's not at all what happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you can imagine, um, uh, studying parish data, first you have to get your hands on it and, and parishes, uh, there, there were two sort of, um, competing, uh, issues to that. One was, uh, sometimes the parish wouldn't know how to get their data. Um, how do we, how do we get the data out of the computer? How do we get our, our giving data, our, our parishioner data out of the database? And then two, well, well, Rob, who are you? Why would we share this information with you? Um, so uh, that was a challenge that that eventually I was able to overcome, um, and and the result was I was getting parish data in sort of bits and pieces, and and it wasn't consistent at all. So uh, one parish would just give me zip codes, and then another parish would give me addresses plus giving, and it was just sort of this mishmash. So I, I realized early on I had to simplify the process um, to to kind of understand how how it all works and fits together. In, impressive and and very ambitious. Um, I'm sure it took a lot of commitment to get those uh, those spreadsheets and get just to get the data to analyze and then yeah. to spend the time analyzing the data. I remember when Chuck Zek's book came out. I believe it was around the mid to maybe closer to the late 90s. And it was called Why Catholics Don't Give and What Can Be Done About It. Yeah. And I remembered I was working in parish ministry at the time for a pastor who was very focused on stewardship, uh, time, talent, and treasure, really mm -hmm. engaging parishioners and doing a, an annual uh, offertory uh, um, renewal and, and really focusing in on, on the spirituality of stewardship. And because it was we, we were in the Philadelphia area, we got to meet Chuck actually visit awesome. his parish and yeah. uh, and get to know Chuck a little bit on a personal level. But it was it was um, astonishing to me just to learn, even at that point in my career, we're going back almost 30 years, but that Catholics have always been among the lowest givers, uh, among other Christian denominators, denom denominations. I mean, like the, in the top, maybe the bottom three, maybe we're two from the t from the bottom that 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 low. So it's, it's crazy. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity for growth there as well. And uh, certainly some parishes are up way above the curve and some dioceses mm -hmm. are, and then others are probably meeting that that standard. But tell us a little bit about uh, what you found out in your results, Rob. Yeah. Um, so so uh, nothing that I found out is um, surprising, but, but it is very interesting, if I can put it that way. So um, perhaps the first finding is that Catholics are generous, right? Um, uh, the parish giving to the parish is not the extent of their Catholic giving. Um, so there's Catholic charities, there's the Catholic school, there's your alma mater. Um, there's, there's a lot of different, um, Catholic institutions that Catholics in general like to give to. Um, you think about the, even the national causes, um, Catholic relief services and, um, uh, Catholic University in DC. These are all things that that Catholics give to. Um, so that was really interesting as well. Um, the idea that Catholics are writing different checks or logging in online and however people give these days. Um, so I think that was the first one. Part of the study, um, we 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 took uh, the parish data and we analyzed it against sort of this. Uh, this box that I built. And in the box is, is a lot of different data. So uh, data from Giving USA, data from the IRS, um, uh, different tax resources um, to, to try to understand um, uh, of the people who give, how, how much capacity do they have to give? So for example, um, what, what zip code do you live in, Jim? 18106. So, so one eight one zero six. So we would say, okay, let's let's get a profile of a, a typical person who lives in one eight one zero six, understanding their income levels, their uh, uh, tax deduction levels, the the amount of philanthropy that they give every year, um, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all open source, public information. And then let's sort of wash it through an algorithm, and let's let's uh, uh, put this data that I was able to get from parishes against this and try to understand within the parish um, how much capacity is there. And so uh, uh, what what this study revealed is that Chuck Zeck was right on. 
Um, so uh, most parishes, if they're not really doing anything in terms of stewardship, they're hovering like right at that 1.1, 1.2% um, uh, total income uh, level that, that, that Chuck talked about. We were able to confirm that. Um, and uh, I think that the, the bigger story here is that Americans typically give two to 3% of their income. That's, that's uh, according to the IRS. Uh, but Catholics, they typically give two to 5% of their income. So 1.1% um, is going to the parish, but two to 5% of the, the household income is going somewhere else. So that tells me this is a market share issue. Right. Um, how do we sort of increase our market share among the parish? Um, so that was finding number one is, is that, that, yes, Catholics are very generous. They're just not necessarily generous to the parish. There was another study that um, was done by the USCCB a number of years ago. It might be even 10 years ago now um, that said 53% of Catholics who are sitting in the pews at mass would give more if the pastor asked them. Um, and the pastor just doesn't ask. So connecting those two data points, the fact that there's a lot of capacity for Catholics to give more with the fact that 53% of Catholics would give more if only asked, well, the finding is, uh, Father, you need to ask for more money. Um, and, and without going too far down, to the, down the rabbit hole, um, it, that led to other questions like, well, why aren't pastors asking for money? Um, and I asked a lot of pastors this question. Well, we, we don't need it right now. Everything's fine. Our maintenance fund is, is, is fine, Our, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so that led me to think, well, I, I think they need to work on vision uh, and, and some of these other things to, uh, to sort of help support the, the argument to receive more in philanthropy. If I could jump in, Rob, I, I think it's so interesting what you're saying, because having been, you know, we both were in the role of diocesan development director. So we got to see on some level the giving that happened at the parish level. We got to see what was going on at the diocesan level. Mm -hmm. Many of our colleagues now uh, also run diocesan foundations or they're a separate entity. So there's restricted giving for other things. For a time, I worked um, with the Catholic schools in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, and I was just overwhelmed and impressed with uh, what some of these alums give to their mm -hmm. alma maters. Catholic schools and are part of the identity of, of those who went to uh, Catholic school in Philadelphia. It, it was always what what parish and where'd you go to high school um, when, you, when you talk to folks around here. So um, completely understand and get that market share piece. I think that makes so much sense. And I think it also makes sense, you know, may, maybe it even emboldens a little bit a pastor who might be saying, well, you know, my people don't have it or they, they, you know, they're not engaged or whatever. And maybe like you're saying, it's about just trying to capture a little bit more of that market share, making the case for support a little bit, show, lending, uh, sh sharing what the, what the needs are at the parish and, and what we're doing with the tithing that is making an impact in the community. Yeah. telling the story just as we do as fundraisers. So I, I yeah. just, I, that really resonates with me. I think that's so interesting. Yeah. And, and understanding the story themselves, I, I think, you know, pastors aren't taught to, to fundraise, right they And nor are they taught to um, uh, sort of provide maintenance for their parish, you know, physical for the physical plant, that kind of, there's a lot of things they're not taught to do. And yet they're thrown into these, these situations um, and so part of this, this blue philanthropy project, I think, is to give the tools to the pastor to create that vision. Right. Um, so uh, I, I'm working on a presentation right now where I talk about, you know, let's let's create a, pres uh, a vision beyond the boiler. Right. So the, the boiler, I think, is the typical sort of, uh, you know, punching bag for us fundraisers uh, uh, in, in the Catholic space. Uh, we say, Father, don't raise money for the boiler, raise money for the parish vision, raise money for uh, faith formation, raise money for um, all these uh, charitable outreach, What you you name it, for, for liturgy, et cetera, et cetera, of which, yeah, the boiler is a small part. You know, the boiler right. will take care of itself if we can answer these big, big questions. Um, so, so that's really where this data is kind of leading me, which is to say, like, parishes need um, kind of a, a vision that can be 
sort of packaged up, I guess, and maybe that's not the right term, but um, and and explained and communicated and articulated to to the people. And once the people sure. understand it, they'll give. We know they'll give because yeah. <laughs> the studies say they will. Well, I, it's interesting. You know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of of our conversation this pastor that I used to work with that was so focused in on stewardship. Um, we needed a boiler during the seven and a half years yeah. that we worked together, and we didn't have to raise money for it because the money was already coming in because people were excited about the vision, the things that we were doing that were beyond keeping the lights on, beyond paying the heating oil bill, the fact that we were doing things around evangelization, around um, youth ministry, around uh, we had a Catholic school, the, the investments we made there, that there was, like you're saying, this larger vision that people got excited about so that we had the money in the budget and in the savings so that when the $80,000 kicked in that we needed for the boiler, it was there. You didn't yeah. have a special fundraiser for it. Yeah. We were able to pull it out of savings uh, because the funds were there. So I, I think that's kind of the catch 22. Do I want to get them excited about the boiler or do I want to get them excited about something much bigger that will have ma major impact on, on all giving and philanthropy and, and stewardship? Um, and then I don't have to ask for the small things. You for know? sure, for sure. Yeah. And, and I think if you look at some of the issues that the church is facing right now, at least in my parish, and this is, you know, uh, anecdotally, but but I think everybody can identify with this. Um, we have a lot of uh, parishioners who are upset that their kids or grandkids uh, don't practice the faith anymore. Um, and that that seems like a, a a pretty consistent deal all throughout the United States. And and again, there's statistics indicating that that young people are are falling away, et cetera. Um, I see a huge opportunity to connect that problem to a larger vision, right? Um, and so so parishioner who's upset about this, like, let's build this reality here at the parish, where you know our youth programs are awesome. Um, we have ski weekends for the kids that I chaperone. Okay, um, of course, um, yeah, absolutely. Our our, our um, uh, catechetical formation is is top notch. Like we invest in it. It's not sort of like, well, this person read through the catechism once. Um, let's put them in charge. And I know I know pastors don't do that, but um, let's let's get the best and the brightest to form uh, the future Catholics who come out of this parish. Um, and 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 I think people would. Uh, support that, right? Because that's something yeah. that they really care about. And that, that's just one example. I think there's many examples of how do we face sort of current issues um, by creating a bigger vision and then and then sort of funneling the philanthropy um, to support it. I couldn't agree more. I mean, when, when you can uh, form young people in the faith where they're excited about their faith, where they can defend the faith, um, you're doing a service not only for your own parish, you're doing a service for the entire church Yeah, because those young people will grow up into adults and be the leaders of tomorrow. And they can be the young leaders of today as well. So yes, that, that's absolutely. amazing. Any other big revelations or are you still yeah. uh, kind of winding through? Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, kind of quick, uh, an another thing that we all knew, but this sort of uh, proved it, at least to me, is people migrate. Um, yeah. the, the cool thing about this data is, um, if you get years and years of data from a parish, you can understand migra migration patterns. And especially if if the parishes are in a geographical location, um, I wasn't really able to get my hands on like a full diocese set of data, uh, which would have been awesome, but I, I came pretty close. Um, and, and understanding patterns of migration and then kind of peeling back the, the curtain a little bit to say, um, to, to find out why are people migrating? Um, often it's it's based on pastor, Right. Um, and I know that is is sort of Catholics, uh, Catholic leaders. We don't like to see that because we want people to sort of stay in their own geography and build that community uh, to which uh, to which they belong. Um, but nonetheless, we know what happens. And this sort of proved that. And so uh, one of so related to that outcome or related to that, that finding rather, um, I uh, who's it? Father White from Baltimore. Sure. Yeah. The rebuilt um, parish. Yeah. Yeah, it, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, rebuilt. Uh, he had a, a theory that if we have great worship and uh, like great music and great homilies, people will come. And that seems to have come through uh, in through this data and in the migration patterns of, of parishioners. Um, so uh, I think the takeaway there is uh, if you want 
your church to thrive, it happens in the liturgy. Um, it, it, and which is awesome, right? Like it's the heart of what we do. And, and, and I think there's, there's some beauty to that. And again, another philanthropy strategy, if you will. Right. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, you know, how, how do we increase the, the overall quality of, of the liturgical experience at our parish? Yeah. When um, you say uh, migrate, Rob, when folks are, mi- are they migrating away from the faith or migrating to other parishes or? or... Yeah. Sorry, Jim. Uh, yeah. They're, they're migrating from other parishes. So they'll, they'll okay. move, right? Yeah. So um, for example, if uh, let's, let's make up a priest, Father, Father Joe, mm-hmm. um, Joe Smith is, is a popular pastor on the South side of town. Um, and then he gets moved to uh, another parish on the west side of town. Well, all of a sudden you see uh, zip codes from the south side of town that that were at that parish yeah. on the south side of town. They're they're now moving in membership to this other parish. So they're in a sense following Father Joe. Interesting. Um, yeah, and, sure. and I think the conclusion is like those numbers, I mean, they're not insignificant numbers. In some cases, like 10%. Um they're they're following him because they like what he's doing and mm-hmm. often that is teaching it's homilies uh and and music yeah well that makes sense and and praise god that they're staying in the church and 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 following him rather than just leaving the church altogether if they're frustrated yeah. with the new pastor so absolutely you know i think uh, that may have been frowned upon back in the day um staying in the parish boundaries or lines or whatever but uh, today, hopefully, folks have a, a broader sense of evangelization that we we just we need to keep people engaged and keep them in our yeah. faith. Yeah. yeah, and and it's just a condition of our time. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, sure. uh, our our bishop uh, here in Colorado Springs, our, our previous bishop, um, uh, just immense respect for, and, and sadly he passed a few years ago, um, Bishop Sheridan. Uh, but but he came from an era where people were obligated to go to the parish uh, within their geography. So the parish that was within their geographic it was boundaries. pretty standard back then, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and, uh, and it's just a different world. And he he understood that, but he would always sort of lament like, well, why don't people want to build up their their local parish? It, you know, they mm-hmm. it's a shorter drive, people, <laughs> you know. Right. But yeah. we live in a different world, and, and I think most people realize that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, one more finding that I thought was really interesting, too, was um, parish registration is a uh, sort of antiquated, uh, many parishes use sort of an antiquated method um, to capture parish registrations. And um, uh, so the the people who are sitting in the pews don't much reflect sort of uh, the people who are registered in the parish um, because those registration rolls might be very old. Uh, they're not up to date. And, you know, millennials, Gen Zers, they just don't register in the numbers Mm-hmm. Uh, that Xers and Boomers and uh, uh, prior to that did. So I think there's a major play. So if there's a takeaway uh, from this podcast to your listeners, Jim, um, uh, make a play for innovative re- parish registration. And and what that could look like is, you know, <laughs> put up a QR code, like either in your bulletin or uh, some some parishes. My parish has screens um, that we use for for the music. Uh, put a QR code up there and, and say, hey, register at our parish and have a real quick and easy form uh, to do that. Um, and Love it. and from that, you can fuel greater engagement. Okay, well, we know who's coming to Mass. Let's email them. Let's contact them. Let's invite them uh, to do parish things. So, You know, it's interesting you say that. A, a friend of mine uh, who used to work full-time for our parish, she's now retired. Um, she was our, our religious ed director, Chris, I'm talking about you. I don't know if Chris <laughs> listens to our podcast anymore, but, um, she was our DRE for years and now she's just kind of re- semi-retired and, uh, but still very much engaged with the parish. So the, the two things that she does that I find so interesting is when somebody registers, she's the person that calls them and even sometimes goes to visit them or maybe sets up a zoom call with them and just spend some time going through who we are as a parish. And I, I just think that's beautiful, yeah. uh, especially coming from a lay person who's, you know, been involved for many years and welcomes them. Um, so I, you know, one of the things that my old pastor used to do, he had a, he had an ambassador welcome committee, you know, we may, they went out and visited folks with a little welcome packet and a little care mm. package from the parish. And here's who we are and here's what we do. And, you know, let's talk about all the amazing ministries that we, we have going here and, how we can get you engaged or involved. Yeah. So I just think that's so welcoming. And, yes. and I think it's the kind of engagement that Christ would call us to. But um, the other thing she does, which I think is so interesting from a ministerial standpoint, is when someone 
is interested in RCIA. So she she's still very much in the forefront of that. Uh, they they call the parish and then they direct him to Chris. And then Chris will do either an in-person cup of coffee with them or, or a Zoom or whatever is most convenient for that person. And they'll, you know, they'll talk about their desire and interest in getting involved in, in becoming Catholic. And then she'll say, well, when do you want to get started? And they'll say, well, when do your classes start? And she said, well, they can start right now. So she just kind of starts to walk with them like from day one, you know, mm-hmm. and and so she's kind of that one, does that one-on-one -on -one ministry with them. And I just think that's so beautiful. I mean, that's the way Jesus did it, right? It's like, okay, you want to be one of my disciples? Let's go. You know, let's start yeah. today. Let's not wait. Let's not sign up for a class and hope you show up or, you know, don't lose interest. But she's meeting them right where they're at. And I think so many, just like you're saying with the QR code, I think so many of our ministries need to meet people where they're at and just yeah. identify, identify and recognize where, how society has shifted and changed. Yeah. And I, I'm glad you said that, Jim. It, it's, it's such a, such a demanding society. And I think, uh, you know, post COVID perhaps even more so I, um, the demands on our attentions as, as human beings, as Americans, as oh, yeah. Catholics it is intense. And I, I see it in my kids, yeah. you know, the, the schools have, have expectations. Okay. So that's, that's pretty important. You can't, you can't uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of um, neglect those responsibilities and then sports, sports are important, right? They're, mm -hmm. they form kids, they, they help them to you know learn teamwork and all, all the great stuff about sports. Well, that's important. Also the parish is important, right? Yeah. Well, something's going to give. Right. Um, and, and in our modern day, uh, all too often, it's it's going to be the parish, right? That's yep. um, um, unfortunate. It doesn't have to be though, right, Jim? No, it, it doesn't, doesn't have yeah. to be because because mm -hmm. if the journey can start whenever, wherever, um, and that authentic human connection, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be that way. So I, I love I love that. Let's meet yeah. people where they are, especially families. I mean, uh, yeah. my my wife and I, we've got five kids, and you have three, and and you know you. It's it's really tough out there, especially especially now in in this day and age. Yeah. Parish is being able to, I think, support young families and meet them where they're at is is critical. Yeah, I also want to recognize, especially if we have any pastors listening, that you know, Rob and I have worked with hundreds and hundreds of pastors between the two of us, and um, we recognize the uh, um, incredible pressure that are, that is on our parishes. Many of them very. Uh, thinly staffed, uh, have fewer resources to do the, some of the things that we're talking about. But I think um, I think the overall message, what we're thinking of, even if there's just one way in which we there could be further engagement or uh, personalization, or even just sometimes having the courage to make that ask, even when we think, well, maybe, maybe or maybe and I shouldn't. But I think just engagement might be the overall theme here. Yeah. 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 For no, sure. for sure. I you know, it's the the power of the collar, right? I mean, we we yeah. talked about it a lot um, at ICSC, the International Catholic Stewardship Council, and um, you know, it, engagement matters, and and sort of uh, wearing the collar, being the pastor or the priest, um, people will just be excited that that you're engaging, right? You mm -hmm. know, and, and and I say that as a way to take the pressure off, because not not all people are great at that. Um, but if, if you pick up the phone and call a parishioner, um, just the act of doing that is is very powerful. Um, Absolutely. And and uh, engagement of the laity. You know, the person I was speaking of is a laywoman. And uh, that's that's yeah. her contribution to bringing Christ to people. So uh, it also it's a, it's incumbent upon all of us as the laity to be more engaged and to uh, ask our pastor how we can assist in these ways to bring people back to church. What Amen. do you see as, uh, as, as next for blue philanthropy or some of your project here? Yeah. So I, I, um, I've got a, a good friend who, uh, owns a consulting firm in, in Connecticut in the Northeast. And, uh, uh, I say Northeast because it's so far from Colorado, but, um, <laughs> I've, I've, uh, uh, decided to work with him. Um, he, uh, the name of his firm is the giving collaborative mm -hmm. and, and I hope that, um, and, uh, he's got experience with doing Catholic projects, uh, from schools to dioceses, the parishes, to you name it, uh, universities. Um, I'd love to integrate this, um, this study, this line of work into that practice. 
Um, uh, we're, we're all over the country. Um, we've got projects all over the country, all over the world, actually. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to kind of open up uh, some new avenues for, for um, Catholic institutions uh, uh, using this research sort of as a backbone uh, for that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's great, Rob. Well, we will watch with uh, intent eyes and uh, eagerness. And when you uh, bring it to that next level, uh, you know, let me know and we'll, uh, we'll have another conversation. But that's yeah. exciting. That sounds that's great, awesome. Jim. Yeah, I sure will. Absolutely. Well, Rob, thanks for all that you're doing for the church, all that you have done over the last 20 years and all that you will continue to do. And uh, so uh, grateful that you came on and that we got to reconnect in a, in a new way here on the podcast. Yeah. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Thanks for having me, and thanks for for everything you're doing. I've been uh, kind of a longtime follower of this podcast, and um, uh, it's, thank you. It's it's fantastic. It's all part of the new evangelization, right? So absolutely, for, that's what it's all that. about. Thank you, thank you. God bless. All right, thanks, Jim. Well, that's our show this week. I want to thank you, our listeners, for joining me on today's show. I hope you found this conversation valuable and that it has in some way inspired you to take action to advance the mission of our church. And if this is your first time listening to Advancing Our Church, I hope you're going to stick around and subscribe. You can find us on all places where you download your favorite podcasts. You can find us on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And for more information about our show, please visit us at Advancing Our And once again, many thanks to our sponsor, Changing Our World. You can find a link to their website in the show notes of this episode. Well, that's it for me, everybody. I hope you're having a terrific week. We'll see you next time. Take care and God bless.